It's no new fact that dinosaurs have given us the biggest and arguably most remarkable animals to ever walk on the earth. But all the attention for the biggest seems to go to the sauropods if we're talking herbivores. Well, sauropods were ridiculous in terms of size, but that doesn't mean that the rest were small fry. In fact, it's hadrosaurs that has given us the biggest land animal ever that wasn't a sauropod. Back in 1964, Chinese paleontologists were hard at work uncovering a total of five giant skeletons. They were so big in fact, that it took them four whole years to get these suckers out and a further five years to describe them. Noted was the very close relationship between this animal and the famous Edmontosaurus, a huge hadrosaur from North America that would have fed a T-Rex for days. The specimens found in the Shandong province eventually brought forward a paper in 1973 in which the new dinosaur was named Shantungosaurus giganteus. And as you can probably guess from the name, this was a big boy. As far as we can tell, Shantungosaurus was actually a fairly typical hadrosaur in terms of morphology, being comfortable on all fours when standing or moving at a relaxed pace, but also being more than capable of rearing up onto two when it needed to get a shift on along with the famous duckbill mouth that had a clipping, toothless beak at the front and batteries of constantly replenishing teeth lining the jaws. Where this guy does stand out is simple size. The skull alone was nearly as long as a typical adult human is tall, and the overall size of the animal has, like any other dinosaur, oscillated through various estimations. From 14 to 17 meters, or 46 to 54 feet long, up to 5 meters, or 16.4 feet tall, and anywhere between a massive 13 to 16 tons in weight. It's not even like these are large estimates either, since one site actually showcased between 50 to 100 individuals of varying size, the average weight estimate of which came in at well over 10 tons. This would indeed make Shantungosaurus the largest non-sauropod, as well as nearly double the weight of the largest land predator to ever live, Tyrannosaurus rex. Meaning that even the king would have to think twice about taking this thing on if they ever met. Going back to the skull, Restorations will often show some embellishments near the front of the snouts, since a large hole can be observed near the nostrils. This hole may have been covered by a variety of skin flaps or crests, with the hole being used to feed either air or blood into the area in order to make noise or make some sort of display. It's also handy to take a look at another huge and famous hadrosaur, this time from North America, the aforementioned Edmontosaurus, who like I said was actually Shantungosaurus's closest relative. Whilst not quite as big as Shantungosaurus, it certainly wasn't far off at a solid 12.2 metres or 40 feet long and around 6 to 7 tonnes, with some individuals possibly getting as big as 15 tonnes. One amazing insight we've gotten from Edmontosaurus that we can apply to Shantungosaurus comes from soft tissue remains. Several specimens of Edmontosaurus have been found with soft tissue remains, with one even being nicknamed a mummy. These have shown that the animal was scaly, with differing sized scales that appear to have formed patterns, along with possibly sexually dimorphic head crests. Another interesting piece of soft tissue found was that of the manus, or front feet. Traditionally, hadrosaurs have been illustrated as having five-toed forelimbs, the middle three of which they walked on and were all separate as implied by the skeleton. But as it turns out, Edmontosaurus, and likely all other hadrosaurs by proxy, had all three walking digits together under a single piece of skin and supported by a single hoof, giving it the outward appearance of only having one single digit akin to a horse. Now, of course, this doesn't mean that all of this applied in the exact same way to Shantungosaurus. They were still different animals, but these features are ancestral and so would have been shared in some form or another, which brings us very neatly into what kind of world Shantungosaurus was living in. This hadrosaur was found in rocks from the Wangxi group of Shandong, China which dates back to around 77.3 to 73.5 million years ago. This area of China at the time was going through a gradual change owing to the southern movement of Asia. This meant that things were relatively colder and drier as it started moving away from the North Pole and grew gradually warmer and wetter as time went on. Making up the area was a series of mountains and valleys, along with rivers, lakes and floodplains, with subtropical forests growing more and more abundant. Living here alongside Shantungosaurus were fellow ornithopods such as Sintausaurus, Tanius, and Laoyangosaurus, and chylosaurs like Panacosaurus, Ceratopsians such as Ischioceratops, Sinoceratops, and Zhucheng-ceratops, as well as the sauropod Zhucheng-titan. Theropods here are relatively limited, 
but include over raptosaurs like Anomalipes and the large tyrannosaur Zhucheng Tyrannus. Despite how large Zhucheng Tyrannus was, it didn't quite hit the size of T-Rex, and again, even that guy likely wouldn't have trifled with a fully grown Shantungosaurus alone. So unless this particular Tyrannosaur hunted in packs, or just had a death wish, it's likely that Shantungosaurus had no natural predators as an adult, especially considering they were also herding animals, finding even more strength in numbers on top of their gargantuan size. Now on the off chance that multiple predators did work together to take these guys down, or again, they were just an adrenaline junkie, it's also possible that Shantungosaurus was a lot quicker than it appears. Again, it's not definite, but if we look back to Edmontosaurus, we see a very hefty animal that, according to biomechanical simulations, could have reached speeds of up to 30 miles an hour to outrun predators such as T-Rex. Now, Shantungosaurus may have been much slower, considering how much speed can vary between closely related species, but it certainly implies that this hadrosaur was more than capable of reaching decent speeds, especially over a long distance. That kind of speed also hints at some pretty decent power too, meaning the paleontologists have theorised that hadrosaurs such as Shantungosaurus were vicious kickers. And anyone who's ever been kicked by a horse will probably tell you that it's an experience you'd rather watch secondhand. When Shantungosaurus wasn't running, however, it was most likely eating. The battery of teeth that this dinosaur had is highly characteristic of hadrosaurs, since they contain hundreds of individual teeth that were constantly growing through to replace ones in use as they wore away. This amount of wear and tear on the teeth was extremely high, with a large amount of abrasion seen on the teeth that were on top and were in the most use. This might actually give us a clue as to whether this animal was a low grazer or high browser too, since lower plants tend to have more microscopic abrasive minerals on them as they fall and settle from higher places. This is why animals like cows and horses have extremely resilient teeth, since grass is pretty much covered in microscopic glass. It would appear that Shantungosaurus had the ideal teeth for this job that showed the wear and tear, though they were certainly big enough to rear up to clip and strip branches of high trees. But maybe it's also this immense size that was their downfall. We see that Shantungosaurus didn't quite make it to the end of the Cretaceous, having gone extinct around 7 million years before the asteroid hit, so we can't blame that for its disappearance. Instead, it's thought that this huge size ended up being a hindrance once its environment started to see changes. This is exceptionally common in large animals such as dinosaurs. Those huge bodies require a lot of fuel, and if that fuel starts becoming more scarce, those with less demanding bodies will fare much better. It's also not like it could have radiated out to other areas either, since other large herbivores had already established themselves in other areas. Another thing thought to have maybe played a part is volcanism, since pyroclastic flow deposits are relatively common in this formation, which, whilst they can renew an environment in the long run, are still devastating for the poor locals living there at that moment. Or maybe it didn't go extinct and simply changed. If Shantungosaurus evolved into something smaller, it could have adapted to require less food. Who knows, maybe something like Kundurosaurus, which was half the length and a fraction of the weight of Shantungosaurus whilst also being a very close relative that lived a little later. This would show how this genus adapted and survived under the radar. We're just going to have to wait for more research on that one. As always though, we should occupy ourselves in the meantime with today's Q&A, the first of which comes from Kevin Amory5922, who has asked, I'd be interested in a more detailed look at the mid-Cretaceous extinction slash changeover, e.g. how the world went from sauropods, carcharodontosaurs, ichthyosaurs and pliosaurs to being dominated by hadrosaurs, ceratopsians, tyrannosaurs and mosasaurs. So I have looked into this before but we can try to take a more detailed look into it group by group. But it is all related to one thing, the rise in sea levels. Starting with the sauropods, a late Cretaceous hiatus has been noted in North America and Europe. The likely cause of this is the rise in sea levels turning much of Europe into archipelagos and splitting North America in two, thus taking away much of the environments that sauropods depended on so heavily. From here, other herbivores such as the hadrosaurs and ceratopsians filled those niches, but a particular group of sauropods did make a slight comeback, with titanosaurs coming up from the southern hemisphere and giving us the likes of a Lamasaurus. It's also a Lamasaurus that may have also pushed predators like Tyrannosaurus to grow giant. And speaking of predators, Sauropods served as a very important food source for the many huge allosauroids such as Carcharodontosaurids during the early Cretaceous. So it stands to reason that with the reduction of sauropods, 
These guys would start to feel the struggle too, before the Tyrannosaurs did the same thing and took over empty niches after coming over from Asia. In the sea, this rise in sea levels that occurred right at the start of the Lake Cretaceous had more negative effects than you might think too. As organisms that rely on sunlight get deeper and deeper, this changes the balance as trophic systems start to break down. The addition of more dead bodies would have also changed the chemistry of the ocean, meaning that this was an anoxic event that pushed the already struggling ichthyosaurs and pliosaurs over the edge. This is when we see, yet again, other plesiosaurs and mosasaurs take over those empty niches. Our next one comes from Leonardo XXHD5186, who's asked, With the knowledge that at least some families of dinosaurs, maybe even all, have the air sacs within their bodies, I ask myself this question. How exactly does that influence the way that we estimate their weight? I'll tell you how. It makes estimation a bloody nightmare. So despite how big some dinosaurs got, they were actually a lot lighter than they appeared owing to the avian air sac system that ran through their bodies. This system is seen in birds today and can best be described as a series of mini lungs throughout the body. Now we do use birds to help with some weight estimations of other dinosaurs. The problem is that there aren't many large bodied birds for comparison, none of which reached the colossal sizes that certain non-avian dinosaurs did. You also have to remember that birds are theropods, meaning they have very different body shapes to the other more varied groups. So that would also mean that how much weight they carry will be comparatively different. We'll never know many things for certain, but weight estimations are always one of the things that ranges the most and has the most amount of disagreement. Anyway guys, thank you so much for watching. Sorry you haven't been able to see my face. It's a long story. But I hope you leave a like and a subscribe so that I can catch you guys next time.